it's a real honor to welcome Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, who is a founding director of the Institute for the Study of Health and Illness and clinical professor of family and community medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. Her course, The Healer's Art, is presently taught in 70 medical schools here and abroad. abroad. So, it's really impressive. Her intensive continuing medical education programs have enabled many thousands of physicians and other health professionals to deepen their sense of calling and service. Dr. Remen wrote the New York Times bestseller, Kitchen Table Wisdom, Stories That Heal, and the national bestseller, My Grandfather's Blessings, Stories of Strength, Refuge, and Belonging. She has received three honorary degrees and many awards in recognition of her work in including, including the Braywell Award for pioneering the field of integrative medicine. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Dr. Remen. I'm delighted to be here. And, you know, Gayatri, when she spoke to me on the phone to invite me, um, I asked her what I should talk about, and she said, uh, talk about women in medicine. And that sort of baffled me a little. <laughs> Last week, I spent a lot of time thinking about what, what, what's there to say about women in medicine. But um, last night, um, just before I got here, I uh, checked in on my uh, email and discovered that one of the staff at the institute had left, me, had left a vacation message for me on my uh, private email. And it said, um, Rachel is at a conference for medicine women. <laughs> And she will respond to your message on Monday. <laughs> so there it was. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, um, this is going to be a medicine woman's talk, about the wisdom of the deep feminine, about the emergence of the deep feminine in medicine and its power to heal contemporary scientific medicine and make it whole. So this will be a more personal kind of talk. No PowerPoints, no references to the medical literature. I'm a storyteller, and I'm going to tell you some stories, my own stories, other people's stories, uh, hopefully to remind you of your own stories. Because, you know, a good story is like a compass. It points to something universal, something unchanging, and it invites us to reflect and to move through the world a little differently, perhaps to live a little larger or work with greater satisfaction or meaning or even passion. And the best stories, um, they actually give us do eyes. They can change the way we see ourselves. They can remind us of who we are, what matters, what we might do or be or even become. And of course, the very best stories heal us. They free us from beliefs that have made us small and open us to possibilities. Um, they can even help us become more than our training or our professional culture has allowed us to be. And I, of course, am a survivor of another time in medicine, a time when it was possible to be the only woman in your medical school class, the only woman on the house staff, and one of three women faculty on a pediatric department faculty in a major school. A medicine where it was possible to be an instructor for eight years until your own students eventually passed you in academic rank. 
I'm a survivor of a time when John Wayne could have been the father of medicine. <laughs> and being a woman was a professional liability. And you know, our house staff was divided into three teams. And my first year, um, each of these teams was headed by a chief resident. My first year on the house staff, the three chiefs drew lots. And the one who lost got me as an intern. Right? And I remember about six months after this event, I was running through the underground tunnel with the same chief resident at about 3 o'clock in the morning. And we'd been called um, to uh, help uh, uh, at a premature birth of some very, very premature twins. And we almost lost them. But we pulled them out. We stabilized them. And we got them tucked into the ICU. Uh, and now we were running side by side back to the house staff residence, talking about what had just happened. And he, as we're running side by side, he says to me, you know, I hadn't wanted you on my team, but I was wrong. Working with you is like working with a man. <laughs> but I was thrilled, thrilled. I actually thought that this was a precious validation. And I held the moment very close to me for years before I understood what it really meant. You know, there are many ways to give away your power, and some of them are very subtle and very seductive. And some of us may still be giving away our power in this very same way. John Wayne is not the father of medicine. There's another older formula for the ideal physician, a formula that comes from the Middle Ages. And it goes like this, that the doctor must have the eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, and the hand of a woman, which is a reminder that only through the mediating power of the feminine does the hard edge of science become a work of healing. Only through compassion and empathy and relationship and intuition and mystery. You know, being a doctor is actually a worldview. It's actually a cosmology. It's a story about the nature of the world, the nature of other people. And as a doctor, I was trained to see the world as broken and to see other people as broken also. And that the only way to fix that was by acquiring scientific knowledge, technological expertise, and of course, you could never acquire enough. Never. You could never be enough. You know, um, our ability to make change, to make a difference in the world, is only as good as our because the cosmology is accurate. Our cosmology informs our action, our sense of possibility. It limits or expands our capacity to make a difference. And fixing a broken world is a very limited way of seeing. It also happens to be the very embodiment of masculine principle. So what is the missing piece? And let me offer you another cosmology, a much older way of seeing and thinking about the nature of the world and the nature of people, a medicine woman way of seeing that the world is not broken, the world is hidden. And seeing the world through the power of the feminine principle is remembering that we can evoke the hidden and make it manifest and real. And this is something, this story that I want to tell you now, the old story, is from the 14th century. And it's something my grandfather told me uh, oh my goodness, uh, almost actually 70 years ago, when I was about four years old. My grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi and a student of Kabbalah, the mystical arm of Judaism. So I guess grandma might say he was a flaming mystic 
but he, <laughs> he was also a wonderful storyteller. And this is the story that he called the story of the birthday of the world. The story of the birthday of the world. And it goes like this. <clears throat> In the beginning, there is only the holy darkness. The Ein Sof, the source of life. And at some point in the history of things, the whole world as we know it, the world that my grandfather always referred to as the world of a thousand, thousand things, the whole world as we know it emerged as a ray of light from the heart of the holy darkness. And then, probably because this is a Jewish story, there was an accident. And the vessels that contain the wholeness of the world break open. And the wholeness of the world is scattered into an infinite number of sparks of wholeness. And they fall into all events and all people and all organizations and all institutions where they remain deeply hidden until this very day. Now, according to my grandfather, the whole human race is a response to this accident. We're all here because we're able to discover and uncover the hidden wholeness in all of life's events, in all people. We can tend it and nurture it and support it and strengthen it and lift it up and make it visible once again. And thereby, we are able to restore the world back into its original wholeness. And this is a collective task. It's a task that involves all people, those who have been born before us, those who exist with us, those who are yet to be born. Restoring the world back to its original wholeness, healing the world. So according to Kabbalah, we are all healers. Just exactly as we are, we are capable of healing the world just exactly as we are. And the story suggests that our power to make the world whole is a function of relationship, not a relationship between a problem and an expert, but the relationship between two fellow human beings. Medical school does not train us to be fellow human beings. So many of us have sold ourselves short. We think our expertise is all we have to offer. But you know, my grandfather wanted me to take the story of the birthday of the world very personally. He wanted me to understand that this was not just a story about the world. This was a story about me. And he wanted me to know my power to affect what is hidden, to strengthen it. And your grandpa used to visit me every Sunday. And sometimes he bought me presents. And very soon after he told me the story of the birthday of the world, he, he brought me a present. And it was a little paper cup. I was excited. I, was excited. I couldn't wait to see what was in it. And I was sure it was going to be something magic because grandpa was so magic. But when he gave it to me, I saw that it was filled with dirt. And I was disappointed. You know, I was an only child of older parents. I wasn't allowed to play with dirt. And I, re I, re <laughs> I reminded him of this. But he just laughed, and he took me in the kitchen. He showed me how to put a little bit of water in the cup. And he said, Nishuma, put a little bit of water in the cup every day. If you do this, something can happen. Now. This made no sense to me at all. I was a New York City child. I had no idea what can happen if you put water on dirt. All right? But you know, adults were always telling me things that didn't make any sense to me. Cross on the green instead of the red, but the red was so much prettier. And I was a little one. I was only about four. And I loved my grandfather. And so I promised him I would do this strange thing, put a little bit of water in the cup every day. The first week was pretty easy. I was excited to see what was going to happen. 
But when nothing did, the second week got harder. And when he visited me the second Sunday, I tried to give the cup back to him. But he, he wouldn't take it. <laughs> what he said was, every day in Ashumala, something can happen. And the third week got to be very hard. I would forget to water the cup. And sometimes I would only remember after I'd been put to bed, and I'd have to wake up, and, and in the dark, I'd have to go into the kitchen and put water in the cup. But I didn't miss a single day. And one morning, there were two little green leaves in the cup that hadn't been there the night before. And, and the next day, they were actually bigger. I was astounded. I was sure my grandpa was going to be just as surprised as I was, you know. <laughs> but he wasn't. What he said was, Ah, Nishimala, life is everywhere, hidden in the most unexpected and surprising places. I was delighted. And I said, and all it needs is water, Grandpa. And he said, no, Nishimala, all it needs is for you to believe in the things you cannot see. The world is not broken. The world is hidden. And because of this, something can happen. Everything has in it a dream of itself, a hidden wholeness. It's possible to collaborate with that dream, to strengthen it. So how would that play out in the real world of medicine? So let me tell you a story about myself. I have Crohn's disease which I've had for now about 60 years. Had it since I was 14 or 15 years old. And in all that time, I've had nine major surgeries. And the story that I'm going to tell you is a story from the time I was 27 years old. I was a single young woman, and this was my first surgery. And in this surgery, most of my intestine was removed, and I was left with an ileostomy. Um, and this is, of course, a very common procedure these days, but it wasn't common all those years ago. It was radical, even experimental. And it caused a great deal of excitement in the week that I was hospitalized. I was visited by almost every member of the surgery department. And, of course, they weren't visiting me. They were visiting my incision. And they had come to see for themselves that I had survived this 10-hour surgery. And unquestionably, this surgery saved my life. I had outstripped all of my medical treatments. Nothing was helping me. And the surgery was life-saving. There was only one problem with it. I couldn't live with it. I was a single young woman, and I felt separated from everything that was elegant or feminine. I just felt I could not go on with this radical change in my body, and I became profoundly depressed. And in the week I was in the hospital, I actually became suicidal. And you know, all of these people came to visit me. No one noticed this. And you know, you have very odd thoughts. This hospital that I, I was a patient in, I was also on staff. I was a doctor. I was a young doctor. And I didn't want to commit suicide in the hospital and embarrass my colleagues, right? <laughs> so I started saving my sleeping pills and my pain pills. And I would pretend to swallow them, and then I would keep them in my bedside table. My whole plan was that I would take them all when I went home. I would take them all at once, you know, and kill myself with them. And again, all these people came to visit me. No one notice my state of mind at all. And among the people who visited me every day beside those surgeons was a, a group of, of professionals who were called in those days enterostomal therapists. These were experts in the care of my appliance. They, they came to change my appliance daily uh, because I couldn't do this for myself. And they were, by and large, nurses. But they were also young women, almost exactly my age. And they'd come into uh, my room wearing their white coats uh, to change my appliance every day. And they would put on a gown. 
a mask, an apron, and gloves. And they'd remove my old appliance, replace it with a fresh one. And then they would take off the gown, the apron, the mask, the gloves, and they'd go to the sink in my room and very carefully wash their hands. Now, this was not helping me accept the radical change in my body. It humiliated me. And it made me deeply ashamed. But towards the end of the week, a woman I'd never seen before came to do this for me. And she was late. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And she was not wearing a white coat. She looked like she was about to go out on a date. And she was wearing a twin set and pearls and heels and stockings, you know. <laughs> and I should have realized something very different was about to happen because when she asked my permission uh, to change my appliance, she then went to the sink in my room and washed her hands before she touched me. And then she came to the bedside. And I was lying there wearing this outrageous, frilly, black lace nightgown covered with little black ribbon bows, right? And this was a gift my friends, who knew how depressed I had become and how unfeminine I felt, had bought for me. They, they were trying to cheer me up. They were trying to help me. And she took one look at this sea of black lace and little bows, and she said, fabulous. <laughs> Where did you get it? And I told her about this, and it turns out she was newly engaged, and her young man had a kind of a weakness for black lace. <laughs> So we started giggling about men and their weakness for black lace and this and that. And as we're, as we're giggling together, very casually, she reaches into my bedside table, takes out a fresh appliance, removes my old appliance, and replaces it with a fresh one using her bare hands. Now, I was stunned. I was a young doctor. The first thought that went through my mind was, how unprofessional, right? But as she continued to talk to me, and we were laughing together, I began to watch her hands. And she had on soft pink nail polish. No professional woman wore pink nail polish or any other kind of nail polish in those days. And she was standing so close to me, I could smell her perfume. No professional woman wore perfume. I myself never wore makeup in those days. And suddenly I felt a rush of such strength come up in me from some very deep place. And I knew that I was going to be able to do this thing. I knew it was not going to be easy, but I knew that I could make even this all right. Now, this woman did not give me back my intestine. Medical science, science cannot do that today. What she gave me back was my life. Not because of her expertise, but simply because she was willing to touch me with her bare hands. I don't know this woman's name, and I doubt she remembers me, or the 15 minutes that she spent with me, you know, something like 45 years ago. I'm sure she has no idea of the lifelong effect that she has had upon me simply because she was willing to touch me. You know, we have all healed many more people than we know, not because of our technological expertise and our knowledge, but because of our touch. You know, the medicine woman wisdom has other stories about relationship and the power of relationship to change the world. There's a very beautiful one of, from the American Indian tradition, which concerns uh, Grandmother Spider. Grandmother Spider, who um, tends the web of connection that exists between all things and all people. Um, and the web of connection is, of course, a part of the hidden world. It can never be seen by the eyes. It can only be seen through the heart. And, of course, the heart is not a kind of a valentine. The heart is a way of seeing. 
which allows us to see what is hidden beneath the surfaces of things. But you know, we often become so distracted, so busy, so cynical, so bitter, that we close our hearts. And most people don't notice the web of connection between us because their hearts are closed. We forget that we have been born connected. And Grandmother Spider reminds us that we were born connected. She reminds us of the power of our relationships to make a difference by telling us stories about living open-hearted, by helping us remember our power to touch others, often in simple and very profound ways. And let me tell you one of my favorite stories about this. Elaine is a friend of mine. She's also an expert in domestic violence. Uh, and I was having dinner with her one night. I looked at her across the, the table. She's as delicate as a porcelain cup. She must be about five feet tall. And I found myself thinking, how did she ever get into this brutal field? I mean, how did she get interested in this? And so I asked her. And she said to me, oh, Rachel, my husband, uh, I used to be one of these women. My first husband was an abuser. And apparently he had also been a professional man and a pillar of the community. And in public, he had always treated her as a perfect gentleman. So people actually envied her her life. No one dreamed that her personal life was a living hell. And like many abusers, he had told her the abuse was her own fault because of the stupid things she said and the stupid things she did. And over the years, she had become so ground down that she had come to believe that she deserved to be treated in this terrible way. And all of this ended abruptly one day on a street corner in New York City. She and her husband were visiting as tourists, and they're standing on the corner waiting for the light to change. And she looks across the street, and she sees this beautiful Art Deco building, and she turns to him and she says, Honey, look at that beautiful building. Isn't it gorgeous? And he, thinking that they are alone, speaks to her in the tone of utter contempt that he you know, reserved for their private communication. And he says to her something like, You mean the yellow building? The one that anyone with eyes in their head would know is just like every other building on the street? What an idiot you are. And she did what she had been doing for many years. Uh, she just fell silent. But a woman who was standing next to him, a total stranger, who was also standing there waiting for the, the light to change, turned to him in disbelief and said, uh, What? <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfectly beautiful building. She's absolutely right. And you, sir, are a horse's ass. <laughs> okay. And then the light changed. And this stranger crossed the street and went on with her life. But Elaine said this is the moment that her whole life transformed. She understood she had never deserved the kind of treatment she had received in the past seven and a half years. In that moment, she knew what had been happening. And she also felt a kind of conviction. And she said she knew it would take time and planning. But she was going to be able to leave this man right now. This is not a story about Elaine. This is a story about the stranger. Because if we went to New York this evening and somehow could find her and ask her, excuse me, ma'am, have you ever saved anyone's life? I doubt that she would say, oh, sure, 20 years ago on that street corner. No, I don't think so at all. I think most likely she'd look at us and she'd say, what? <laughs> Save someone's life? You crazy? Do I look like a doctor to you? Right? Our expertise may not be our only tool 
to strengthen the will to live in other people. You know, the feminine principle is the doorway of our capacity to enter into deeper and more hidden levels of relationship, to see meaning, to see the meaning everywhere that is hidden in the routine and the ordinary. Meaning strengthens us, it sustains us in this difficult work, not because it changes our work, but it changes our experience of our work. So let me share a Sufi story with you about the power of meaning to transform work. It's a story about three stonecutters building a cathedral in the Middle Ages. And it asks us to imagine that we're standing there watching these three men cut stone. And each man has brought a rock, and they use their expertise and technique to cut it into a block, a foot, a foot by nine inches. And then someone takes the block away, and another rock is brought, and they cut it into a block, a foot, a foot by nine inches, over and over and over again. And we watch for about 10 minutes. And after about 10 minutes, we go to ask the first man, um, what are you doing? And he turns on us with hostility and, and bitterness, and he says, Idiots, use your eyes. I saw you watching me. You can see what I'm doing. They bring me a rock. I cut it to a block. They take it away. They bring me another rock. I cut it into a block. They take it away. I've been doing this ever since I was old enough to work, and I'll be doing it till the day I die. Why are you asking me such a stupid question? So we back away, you know, and we go over to the second stone cutter, and we ask him the same question. What are, we, what are you doing? And he smiles at us, and he says, ah, I, I'm earning a living here for my beloved family. With uh, the money they pay me, I have built a strong house, and there's good food on the table, and the children are growing well. I'm earning a living for the ones that I love here. And then we move on to the third stone cutter, and we ask him the same question, what are you doing? But his face is absolutely radiant, and he says to us, I am building a great cathedral, a holy lighthouse, where people who have gone adrift and are afraid in the dark can come and know that they're not alone, and it'll stand for a thousand years. Now, all these men are doing exactly the same thing. They're cutting rocks into blocks over and over and over again. But seeing the hidden meaning in the most routine and daily of tasks opens us to the experience of satisfaction and even of gratitude for the chance to do the work. And you know, sometimes this shift in perspective happens spontaneously. And when it does, it changes everything. Harry is an ER doc who has come, uh, he's the, the guy who used to live on the edge of burnout all the time. Very cynical man. Uh, he ran one of the largest emergency rooms in, in San Francisco for more than 20 years. And he came to a series of CME trainings that the Institute did a number of years back. And about halfway through the series, he told us something that happened to him uh, one evening in the midst of his busy uh, emergency room. Uh, a woman uh, had been brought in by ambulance on a stretcher about to deliver a baby. And when he examined her in the ambulance bay on a gurney, he realized that unless her OB was in the building, he was going to get to deliver this baby himself. And so he assured her that he had delivered hundreds uh, of babies down here in the emergency room, and that she could relax and her doctor was on the way, and if her doctor didn't arrive before the baby did, he would deliver her. And he was pleased because, as he says, he enjoyed the technological challenge of, of delivery, testing his own competency. And he had barely finished, you know, saying this to the woman when the baby's head began to crown. And the ER team swung into action around him, and the nurses opened the packs, and two nurses actually were standing on either side of him, holding her knees on their shoulders. 
And right there in the ambulance bay, Harry successfully delivered her of a little baby girl. And everything had gone perfectly. He had freed the after-coming shoulder. There was no cord around the neck. The baby, you know, was doing well. And so he laid her, the baby, across um, his forearm with the back of her head in his hand, and he lowered her below the level of the placenta and began to suction her nose and mouth. And suddenly, the infant opened her eyes and looked deeply into his eyes. And suddenly, in that instant, Harry stepped past his usual way of seeing things. And he realized a very simple thing. He was the first human being that this infant had ever seen. And he felt his heart go out to her and welcome from people everywhere. And for just a second, tears filled his eyes. And he felt like he was standing on the threshold of the world. Now, this didn't render him incompetent. It surprised him. But he continued to clamp and cut the cord and complete the delivery. But he thought about it. He thought about it a lot. And as he told this doctor's group, he had always enjoyed the excitement of making rapid decisions and testing his own competency. But he'd never let himself uh, experience the meaning of what he was doing before or what he was serving with his expertise. And you know, he's not a poetic kind of guy, but as he described the moment when the baby looked into his eyes, he called it a holy moment, a holy moment. And he told us that he felt changed by it. What he said is that he had felt years of cynicism and fatigue sort of fall away from him. And he remembered why he'd chosen the work in the first place. And then he'd also felt flooded by a feeling that he couldn't identify. It was different from his usual pride and his competency. But he, couldn't, he just couldn't put a word on it. He was a guy, right? <laughs> so he, he couldn't put a word on this feeling. And he said four days later, he realized it was gratitude for being the one who got to be there to stand on that threshold. Harry says he thinks that this infant is really the first baby that he has ever delivered. He wonders how many other moments of inspiration and connection to the deep meaning of life he has missed in his long career. Uh, he suspects there have been many. So he told us he looks for the holy moments on purpose now. And he says, you know, I can find them everywhere. You know, medicine is a front row seat on life, which means that it's also a front row seat on the hidden world. It's a front row seat on mystery. We've all encountered far more mystery than we've recognized or even noticed. More mystery than we've allowed to touch us with awe and wonder, to awaken us or inspire us. Our professional culture and training doesn't help us feel comfortable with the unknown. You know, indeed, anything that is not evidence-based is often seen as unreal. We've lost the ability, many of us, to meet honestly with the unknown, to simply respond with awe. Or, or just wonder together on the deeper meaning of things, to share questions as well as answers. Let me tell you, this reminds me of a story that happened when I myself was an intern at Sloan Kettering, the great cancer hospital in New York City. And this was the days before hospice, when, it, when someone's care was too difficult to achieve at home. People were brought into the hospital to die. And I remember one such man, I don't remember his name, it's much too long, but I remember his x-rays. His bones looked like Swiss cheese. And he had great snowballs of tumor in both of his lungs. He was rattled with cancer. And in the three weeks that he was with us, every one of those lesions disappeared and they never came back. Now, were we in awe? Certainly not. 
Oh, we were frustrated. Obviously, someone had misdiagnosed this man. So we sent his slides out to pathologists all over the country. And they sent the slides back. They all concurred. This was a classic osteogenic sarcoma. So we held grand rounds. And you know, the word had gotten out of this. We had an unusual case. And there were 350 doctors there. And we all saw the slides, and we all saw the x-rays. And we all saw the man and heard his story. And I remember the conclusion of this grand rounds. It was decided that the chemotherapy that had been stopped 11 months before had suddenly worked. <laughs> now, you know, I sometimes think that too great a scientific objectivity can actually make you blind. But the embarrassing part of this story was that I never questioned this conclusion for the next 15 years. I never thought about it again. You know, when everyone is thinking inside the box, it's hard to think outside of the box. But you know, outside of the box is often where life is. It's possible to research life for many years and not know life at all. You know, I, I sometimes actually think that our professional training is like a disease. It may be necessary to recover from it. Uh, fortunately, this is possible. I am a recovering doctor. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Right? You know, the search for certainty and control which dominates our thinking and our medical culture, which is pure masculine principle, impoverishes our lives. When we trade mystery for mastery, we pay a great personal price. We lose a sense of wonder, of meaning, of awe, of aliveness. And we are left with numbness, cynicism, depression, and compassion fatigue. People who wonder rarely burn out. So I'm going to go a little bit over. And let me just close by something that's very close to my heart, because I'm a medical educator. You know, what, what would it mean to bring the feminine principle into our work as educators? Not to see medical students as empty and fix them by filling them up with techniques and expertise. What would it mean if we instead recognized the hidden wholeness in them and helped them to experience their medicine personally, not only um, as a job, but as a vocation and even a calling, to experience it as something that allows them to express their own unique dream of service, their own values, into a professional community that shares such dreams and can understand them. You know, research documents, there's so much research that documents the growth of cynicism, depression, alienation, hostility, as students move through school and become residents. You know, our training separates us, perhaps, from our hidden selves. And that is what we're measuring in this research, a separation from who we most essentially are. We have lost touch with what is hidden in us, with who we are. Recently, the chaplain of the palliative care service at my hospital came to talk to me about a third year resident, a woman, who had come to her in a state of high anxiety and said, that she had decided to leave medicine. She was two months from the end of her training. She had decided to leave medicine, that she no longer knew herself, and she couldn't go on. And when the chaplain got the story, apparently what had happened is that the resident was involved in running a code, and she was compressing the chest of a man, and found herself thinking 
about her shopping list. And she literally said, you know, I have my hands on the heart of a man who is struggling to live. Someone's brother, lover, father, son. How did I get here? Which is the question that we all need to consider. A true medical education is more than a training. Educare is a beautiful word, the root word of education. It means to lead forth the hidden wholeness from another person. That's what educare is. That's what an education does. It strengthens the hidden wholeness. It enables people to trust it. An education does not offer students a mnemonic for empathy. Rather than evoking from them the natural empathy that has brought them into this work and giving them confidence to express it in their own nat natural creative ways. We have a research paper out, I have an unusual perspective on this, a research paper out on a, on a, a, a question that we ask the students um, in the 70 medical schools. Uh, what is the part of themselves that they can't bring with them to uh, their work? What is the part they have to leave at home? One word, the most commonly spoken word, creativity. Creativity. What is more creative than your own personal relationship with another person? Oh my goodness. So let me tell you a little bit about the healer's art for a moment because it, it is the perspective from which I'm speaking. 21 years ago, I designed a 15-hour elective curriculum, uh, which uh, has, I have taught at UCSF every year since then. And now it's taught yearly in 70 medical schools here. And at the close of 2013, it will be taught in seven countries abroad, schools in Israel, Taiwan, Slovenia, Canada, Australia, Tasmania, India, and Brazil. Almost 2,000 first-year medical students take this course every year. Um, and they're mostly in medical school about four months when they encounter the course. And they write to me about it. I have thousands and thousands of evaluations. And I read as many of them as I can. And so, you know, we have like this keyhole into the experience of first-year medical students. They're not empty. They're deeply connected to the lineage of medicine. They are on fire with the spirit of service. And they are related to the suffering in the world. And they have a lot of wisdom about what is needed to respond to the suffering. And of course, more than 60% of them these days are young women. And the Healer's Art is an experiential discovery model curriculum. It creates conditions of safety, harmlessness between students and faculty. Students and faculty form different relationships with one another where people can share values, experience the power of generous listening to transform pain, recognize the depth of their service intention and its roots sometimes in their earliest childhood. And the course is a place where people tell their stories. And in doing this, they tell each other the story of medicine itself. We're here because people matter. We're here because we want to befriend the life in total strangers, to strengthen the will to live, to recognize it in all of its many manifestations, and to learn our science and the power to cure, but to be more than our science, and trust our own power to heal with listening, compassion, humanity, and love. And in the final session of the Healer's Art, each student and faculty writes their own Hippocratic Oath, their own personal Hippocratic Oath. 
And they uncover in that process their own dream of service and their own way of doing their medicine. And we ask people to reflect on a question. What if medicine didn't tell you how to be, what to wear, what to read, what language to use, what, how to be in relationship to other people? You know, what would your medicine look like then? Where would you do it? What would your office be like? And who would you serve? And what message would your, your medicine give your patients about themselves? about their illness, even about life, and who would your colleagues be? And what qualities would characterize your relationship to your colleagues and to your students? And to write four sentences in the language of help, asking to draw your own dream of service closer to your everyday life. And the language of help is simple. Help me, blah, blah, blah. Show me. Strengthen me. Enable me to. Remind me. And the faculty and the students each write out whatever is written on their hearts. And then we spend about an hour, and this is true in all the healer's arts across the country, reading these things aloud to us, to, to each other. And you know, uh, you can't tell who has been in medical school for four months who's an associate professor of pediatrics or internal medicine. In the reading, the divisiveness of our expertise disappears, and we occupy a common ground, which is the wish to make a difference in the suffering and in the lives of other people. And so I want to close with um, one of these uh, Hippocratic Oaths, I have thousands of them. We save every one <laughs> that has been sent to us. You know, the ways in which we befriend the life in others are very simple, very old, and they've lost none of their power across many generations. And this one particular Hippocratic Oath, which was actually written by a young man, captures it for me, and it goes like this. May you find in me the mother of the world. May my hands be a mother's hands. My heart be a mother's heart. May my response to your suffering be a mother's response to your suffering. May I sit with you in the dark as a mother sits in the dark. May you know through our relationship that there is something in this world that can be trusted. Now, the first time we did this exercise 21 years ago, after everyone in the room had gotten up and read whatever they wrote, a young woman stood up, and she looked at her classmates, and she said, um, I had no idea that's who you people were. I thought I was here alone. So I'm here to remind you that we're not here alone. We are part of a lineage that is more ancient than medicine itself. And we have one another. And the heart of medicine does not need to be hidden. Thank you.